Despite the 2023 economy looking pretty shaky with high inflation, the Federal Reserve raising rates and the stock market suffering over the past 12 months or so, over this time period, many of the world's best investors have been busy buying into the market while most other investors, on balance, have been selling. Warren Buffett, for example, dumped a huge chunk of money into the market in 2022 after being heavily criticized for staying too much on the sidelines in recent years. And this is not an isolated incident. In the crash of 2020, the super investors were buying in. In 2008, they were buying. In 2001, yep, exactly the same thing happened. They were buying in then as well. And in hindsight, this strategy of investing heavily during weak economic periods has worked incredibly well. But there are three fundamental rules to remember to make sure you come out on top. And luckily for us, Warren Buffett disciple Monish Babrai, who is very good friends with Charlie Munger himself and actually once paid $650,000 to have lunch with Warren Buffett, well, Monish recently took the time to explain these three investing rules. So let's talk about them. And the first, which is particularly relevant in times of high inflation and economic weakness, is looking for companies with a durable competitive advantage. Let's say you have some, some small city in, in England and it has no Thai restaurant, for example. And uh, someone looks at it and say, yeah, I think Thai restaurant do really well here. And they open a Thai restaurant and they do really well and uh, they're full all the time and they can charge premiums versus London and other cities. That is going to attract more people and more entrepreneurs to open Thai restaurants until eventually the economics of the Thai restaurants in that small city may be no different from other parts of England. The nature of capitalism is such that if someone builds a better mousetrap, which you know grows a company and generates high returns on equity and very profitable and so on, they have a target on their back. And in general, that will attract a lot more competitors to enter your space. And they'll try to chip away at whatever advantage is there. And this is an important point. Being first to something might work for a while, but it doesn't work forever. You know, Snapchat was first to stories. It lost. Atari was first in video games. They lost. Motorola made the first mobile phones. They lost. Being a first mover is nice and all, but what you need to look for is an intrinsic characteristic of a business that permanently sets it apart from its competitors. Something that another company can't replicate, no matter how hard they try. That's what we call the moat. And we see this a lot these days. There's one type of moat that is always impossible to replicate. And it's one that Monish talks about in this next clip. Now, sometimes what happens in capitalism is we get aberrations. When the, this pharmacist started the Coca-Cola company, he had no idea what he was on to. And no one could have imagined that Coke would end up being the brand it is today. And actually, quite frankly, there's nothing particularly magical about Coke in the sense that they say they have the formula locked up in some bank vault in Atlanta. But it's really easy to clone Coke. And several companies have done that. When Pepsi introduced the Pepsi challenge in the 1980s, they basically gave people two colas to drink with no brands on them. And they said, tell us which one is better. And uh, most people preferred Pepsi it was, because it was a little sweeter. And then after they took the test, they would tell them, oh, by the way, you preferred Pepsi. But if they presented the two drinks to most people with the brands, Coke and Pepsi, most people would prefer to take Coke. So Coke's moat is, if you look at it kind of objectively, really doesn't make any sense. They have a product that can be very easily cloned. They have competitors in many cases who have better products, but a brand got built. And yes, we see it time and time again, the most powerful moats tend to be the brand moats. Monish is right. Coke was objectively proven to be less popular than Pepsi if you took away the label. But with the label on, Coke is the number one drink in the world without question. So businesses with very desirable stickers, despite it being slightly counterintuitive, actually have the strongest moats and are some of the best businesses to own as an investor in tough economic times. Think about it, essentially having a moat means people are coming back to your product or service and won't switch to an alternative. And that's handy because when people are tight on cash, it means they won't buy the cheaper product, they'll still buy yours. Another example of a company with a brand moat is Ferrari. You know, there are cheaper cars out there, there are cheaper hyper cars out there, but Ferrari's demand just never drops. You know, Louis Vuitton, you actually reckon their products are high quality? 
Of course not. They're made out of the same stuff that everything else is made out of. But what people buy is the brand. They want the design. They want the logo and what that represents. But even with that said, no moat is forever. So on top of identifying, we also need to keep tabs that the moat endures through the years. The nature of capitalism is that moat is very likely eventually to get filled in. So if we go back in history, we look at businesses that have survived and thrived for a long time. Very few businesses that are founded make it past their first year. A few will make it past their fifth year, and even fewer will make it past their 10th year, 20th year, 30th year. It just keeps going down. When we look at businesses that may look dominant today, our job as investors is to project what these businesses may look like 5, 10, 20 years from now. And that is a very difficult exercise because you have all these marauding intruders who want to take away your moat, who want to take away those profits, and they're continuously coming at you. That's what makes this a fun and exciting endeavor from my point of view, because trying to figure those things out is not that straightforward. So while Apple is a ridiculously strong company with a big brand moat and a big switching moat, you always need to keep tabs on the strength of the moat as an investor. So how do you spot a moat? Well, remember Phil Town's exercise. Look at the long-term track record of revenue, earnings per share, free cash flow and equity. And, you know, just have a look at whether they're consistently growing at over 10% per year. In the case of Apple, their chart looks pretty good. Remember their equity column gets thrown off due to all the share repurchases, but generally they seem like they have a moat because they've been able to grow uninterrupted for a very long period of time. On the flip side, if we saw declining sales or declining margins, or maybe there's been a lot of negative media sentiment, or they're closing stores, stuff like that, these can all be signs that a moat is in fact being crossed. But yes, anyway, looking for businesses with a moat is really the first big lesson to successful value investing in a tough economic time. But let's now turn our attention to another key element that Monish describes next. So one of the arrows in our quiver as value investors is patience. So in general, we don't really have, for the most part, an information edge. So if I'm looking at a business, there's not much I'm going to be able to come up with about that business that a lot of other people haven't figured out or are capable of figuring out. Then there can be another edge, which is an analytics edge, which is two individuals have the same information, but one person is able to look at that data and come to conclusions that are different from the other person. And so an analytic edge can be a real edge. But even that is difficult because there's a lot of smart people looking at a lot of companies. The one edge that is probably the strongest is, is the time horizon. And even Jeff Bezos says that a lot of his competitors are focused on the next one, two or three years. And he said that Amazon always took the approach of looking out longer looking out five or seven or 10 years. And he said that when they looked out longer and they invested with that longer time horizon, they got an edge and they were willing to make investments where they knew that the payoff is not going to come in three years. Now, this applies to companies themselves, but it also applies to us investors. And I can't stress enough how important this is. Having a long-term outlook is hands down our biggest advantage as value investors that only manage our own money. You know, no one will ever tap us on the shoulder and kick us out because we haven't made a 20% return by next Tuesday. But that is the game being played by the active funds on Wall Street, and it traps them into thinking incredibly short term, literally quarter to quarter. But as Monish says, long-term value investing is a game of patience. We buy great companies at favorable times, and then all we have to do is wait. That's really it. It's boring. It's a game of patience. And it's a game of relative inaction. We wait until the crisis blows over and the recovery kicks in. This might take one year, might take three, might take five. But the point is, we can wait. And when we're patient for great opportunities and then we focus on holding these businesses for the long term, that's when we profit. So I think, yes, a, the ability of an investor to think longer term, and this is one of the reasons why the index does so well. The index is too dumb to know that it owns Microsoft. It's too dumb to know that it owns Alphabet. And it's too dumb to sell these things. And it keeps these things endlessly forever. So we look at the S&P 500 index, for example, which is 500 for the most part, great businesses. And every year they might take one or two businesses out and replace them with one or two new ones. But usually the ones they take out are not the ones that are climbing. Like 
recently they removed General Electric from the Dow Industrial Average. And if you look at the Dow Jones Industrial Average over time, in general, you get rising stars going in and you get companies that have passed their prime being taken out. The S&P 500 would hold an Apple or a Microsoft or an Amazon or Alphabet for 20 years, 30 years. And that type of holding period on these great businesses can be a great edge. And isn't it crazy that the index, the S&P 500, beats over 90% of active fund managers over the long run? It's a pretty good example of just how much a short-term mindset can impair you as an investor. So we stay around businesses that have proven moats and we always look to hold them for a very long period of time. And if you can do those two things, a lot of your long-term risk of loss is taken care of, even if you make a mistake with your valuation. The second approach is where you identify a great compounder that because of people not willing to look at the right time horizons and you can look around the corner, you could pay what would be either a reasonable or even an expensive looking price and end up with a great result. I think you could have paid any multiple for Microsoft when it went public in the 80s, almost any multiple for Walmart when it went public in the 70s, and you would have still done extremely well. So if we, are, if we have a crystal ball that can tell us what a company might look like 50 years from now, 30 years from now, then you know we could buy something at a billion dollar market cap and it might become 200 billion. That's the big advantage with this type of strategy. If you're ultra long-term focused and buy high quality businesses with big moats, you can accidentally buy them expensive and they can still be worth a hell of a lot more in 10 to 15 years from now. No, that doesn't mean you throw valuation out the window, but it is nice to know that if you're buying a high quality business, you can buy it at a fair price as opposed to just buying it at a bargain basement price and you can still do very, very well. That's what Warren Buffett did with Coca-Cola. It's what he did with Apple. There are countless examples. But with that said, Monish also raises one more very important point that you absolutely must remember once you've found that big winner. So have a listen to this. There are very few businesses in the universe of listed companies that would qualify as great businesses. Probably, I would say, less than 5% or 3% of listed companies would qualify as great businesses. If you find yourself in the very happy situation of fractional ownership of one of those businesses, hang on for dear life. This is the one of the biggest mistakes I've made over time. Guy owns a stake in Ferrari, thanks to Monish. Thank you, Monish, for giving Guy the <laughs> Ferrari stake. And Monish doesn't own Ferrari. And when I made the investment in Fiat Chrysler in 2012, when the market cap was $5 billion and their sales were $140 billion, Fiat Chrysler was trading at less than 4% of revenue. And 80% of Ferrari was inside that $6 billion. And plus there was all the Jeeps and Ram and Maserati, everything else in there. And at that time, Abrai Funds owned something like, an, something north of 1% of Ferrari. When I looked through the Ferrari stake, and we made a lot of money on that investment. And one of the dumbest things I did was Ferrari looked optically expensive to me. And, and I sold and we would probably have three times that amount of money if I just kept the position. And like Charlie says, old too soon and wise too late. And that's really the final puzzle piece. Once you find the business that has the wide moat, once you've committed to owning it for a long period to let it compound, and once you've bought it at a fair price, then don't let that go. If nothing fundamental changes, it's better just to keep holding unless it's egregiously overpriced. You know, actually let that business do what you thought it would do over a decade or two. Let it compound over 20 years like Amazon has, like Google has, like Tencent has. That's the key to getting the big multi-baggers, resisting the temptation to cut the flowers and then water the weeds. We need to do the opposite. We water the flowers and we cut the weeds. And that's really the not so secret formula that value investors use to profit during tough economic times. Number one, find the companies that have the intrinsic characteristic that sets them apart, that sets them ahead. Number two, look to hold them for the long term. And three, just don't get caught panicking and selling them before they have been able to compound for you. But overall, guys, they are the three lessons from Monish to help you come out on top investing in a time of economic crisis. Remember, always, always, always stay rational. Anyway, guys, leave a like if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more. But that will do us for today. Thanks very much for watching and we'll see you in the next video.